Okay, welcome. So let's get going on this online NLP coach training. And before we do, I'd just like to discuss a number of themes. And I use these themes and talk about these themes at every training that I do. And the reason for that is it really has an impact on the type of results that we achieve and, and the responsibility that we take in our lives. And so we'll be talking about empowerment. We'll talk about perceptions projection. We'll be talking about focusing on what you want and why that's so important. Talk about the neurotransmitters that bathe every cell in your body and what that actually means. As well as talking about the responsibility for change. So first of all, let's talk about empowerment. And we talk about this dichotomy of cause and effect. So either we are at cause for wherever we are in our life. Or we are at the effect of something having happened. Now, I must say up front, there's no scientific evidence to prove that you are totally at cause for everything that happens in your life. However, it's a very empowering thought from the point of view is, as much as I'm blocking everything or anything outside of me, and I say, I didn't do it, I didn't cause that, as much as I do that, I can't take in any new learnings. So any learnings that I can get from that situation to help me change so I don't create that in the future. So we either are at the effect side of life where we have reasons for not having what we want or we at cause and therefore have the results that we want. Let me get, put this to you in an everyday example. A number of years ago, I around about the age of 35 I wanted to be semi-retired and life was pretty good I had four investment properties uh, you know we had no debt everything everything was going really well for us and I quit my job and I set up two businesses a mortgage and insurance business and then a second business which dealt with leasing finance now that was the beginning of 2008 in 2007 beginning 2008 and of course what happened shortly after around about March 2008 oh no the world went into recession and all hell broke loose now the interesting thing with those two types of businesses is that they both require the banks to lend money by around 2010 we had lost everything so we had loads of clients that you know would like to get money but unfortunately the banks weren't lending any money and again with those two types of businesses all your business pretty much revolves around or being able to get finance for clients now if I'm at the effect side of life I would say oh no the banks didn't want to lend money oh no we are in recession and, and the world is just so awful you know, pretty much blaming everything and everybody around. You know, it's a bad economy. Oh, there's too much pain. It's too dry. It's too wet. There's floods. There's drought. There's, I can't be successful. Whatever it might be. Yeah, those are the effects. They are reasons. Whereas the cause side is much more empowering. Now, that doesn't mean that it takes away the pain of losing everything. But what I can do is look and say, okay, so here I am in this position. I've lost everything. And it is what it is. Now, I created that in one way or another. Obviously, not deliberately. I didn't say, oh, you know, I want to throw away everything that I have. But I can look and I can say, okay, so what did I do that created this situation? What responsibility can I accept? I set up two businesses both within lending criteria. I didn't have any other income whilst I went and set up these two businesses, etc, etc. So there's a number of things that I did that I caused to create that. And as much as I can accept cause, by the way, let's just be very clear. Cause does not mean blame and it does not mean fault. So we never want to put our client at blame and we never want to put our client at fault. So cause simply means I am where I am 
based on my conscious and my unconscious decisions. So what learnings can I take so that I can move from the effect side to the cause side? And this is a topic that I discuss with all of my clients. Uh, by the way, just as we go through the training, let, let's just say that clients includes everybody that you work with. Whether that's your children, your spouse, your business partner, your clients, uh, coaching clients. Think of it really as encompassing everybody and anybody that you might be working with. Just as a, uh, a easy explanation as we move forward for the for the term client. And so, like I said, this is something I discuss with all of my clients. And really, it's our job to help our client to get to the cause side, to empower our client so that they can take the learnings that they need to take and move forward. You see, as Jim Rowan said, he said, the same winds blow on us all. It's the setting of the sail that makes the difference. Now, that's really interesting. The same wind blows on us all. It's the setting of the sail that makes the difference. Being on the cause side, well, it's not always easy. However, it's a lot better than being at the effect side. You know, at the effect side, we can say, oh, they did it to me, or it's somebody else's fault, or it's external environment's fault. And you know what? There's, there's always a support group that can help you for that. There'll always be somebody that'll give you a hug and a kiss and, you know, help to feel better. However, in the long run, it's not empowering. So let's move over to the cause. In fact, why don't we just pretend that over the next week or so, that we are totally a cause for wherever we are in our life. Remember, that's not blame and it's not fault. But let's just pretend that we are totally at cause. And as we do that, just see how empowering that feels. And, you know, maybe you decide to, to play that game moving forward as well. So that's the idea of empowerment. Okay, so the second one is let's talk about perceptions projection. Perceptions projection comes from a guy by the name of Carl Jung, who was a Swiss psychologist. Now, you may have heard of uh, Carl Jung before. He's one of the three forefathers of psychology. And what he said was that what we perceive is who we are. Now, in fact, if you turn to your page 53 in your manual, and let's just look at the NLP communication model. I'm going to look at it very briefly here to explain this idea of perceptions projection. And we're going to come back to it a number of times. So we're on page 53. And so Carl Jung said, what we perceive is who we are. So what we perceive outside of ourselves is who we are. And he also said we tend to marry our unconscious mind and then we project all of our unresolved stuff or our unresolved material out onto them. And so if we look at this NLP communication model, what that shows us is that we have some external event. So something that happens outside of ourselves. And that information is then taken in via our five senses, which is visual, auditory, kinesthetic, olfactory, and gustatory. We get bombarded by this information. Now, actually, there was a gentleman by the name of Mihai Csikszentmihalyi, who was a Hungarian uh, psychologist, and he wrote a book called Flow. And in that, he said we get bombarded by around about 2 million bits of information per second. Well, scientists now say that it's about 11 million. Think of it almost like if I gave you 11 million marbles at one time. Now, you couldn't possibly take all those 11 million marbles at one time in your hands. And so what we do is we delete, generalize, and distort the information as we run that information through our internal filters. And as we do that, we take in only around 134 bits of information. So out of that 11 million marbles that I give you, you might grab a handful, and let's say a handful is 134. 
Well, that would say that, you know, imagine the amount of information then that's left on the table. And if we had the same information coming into us, because let's say we're at the same party, and you grabbed your 134 and I grabbed my 134, well, we could possibly have some of the same information in that 134, but also quite likely there'll be a lot of different information that we take in. And remember, this is based on what we delete, generalize, and distort for ourselves based on our own internal filters, which of course is unique from person to person. And so actually, whatever we perceive outside of ourselves, well, imagine it's somebody, you see somebody and you perceive them to be a certain way. They actually can't be any other way than how you perceive them. You understand that? It's, it's a subjective experience because it's based on each one of our own internal filters. It's based on what we each delete, generalize, and distort. And so that means that we can't perceive anything outside of ourselves that's not already inside of us. Now you might say, you know what Wayne, I can, I can see how this person's my projection and that person's my projection. But surely that person definitely is not me. And what Carl Jung would say, he would say, that thing, that event, or that person we have the most and the as strong a reaction or negative reaction that we have towards that person or event, that is probably the most unconscious part of us. So we tend to take that most unconscious material and project it out on other people and events around us. You see, because what is so un unconscious by the very need needs to be projected so that we can become aware of it. Now you ask, why? You know, what, what's the purpose for that? And really, when we encounter this projection, then we can become conscious of it and we can deal with it. You see, when we get the learnings, then that projection can change. Let me tell you a story. When I was a young boy, I was molested. And for many years, every time I saw somebody or heard of somebody or, you know, saw it on a movie where somebody was molesting a child, I would get so angry. I'd get so angry and I'd really just want to lash out and, you know, if it wasn't my capability, really just go sort out that person, you know, that, that was hurting somebody else. And that had a lot of negative energy in me. I had a lot of anger. And every time, you know, you burst out like that, well, it doesn't actually, it doesn't serve you. In fact, it, it can harm the body. So I was carrying so much anger and negative emotion and, and really I'd have such a negative push against these people. Now, please understand, I'm not saying that now I'm okay with molesters by no stretch of the imagination. But what I was able to do is to notice, okay, this thing had happened to me. What is it that... As much as I have this negative reaction outside of myself towards these molesters, what is it that I need to deal with with inside myself? And of course, and this would be different for different people, but for me, you know, I had to, I had to forgive myself because I felt that, you know, this is my fault. And so I had to forgive myself. I had to let go of guilt. I had to let go of anger. And, you know, I had to let go of some limiting beliefs that were tied around that. And so there was quite a lot of work that I had to do within myself. And now I can look across and I can notice, okay, you know, there's an abuser. I certainly don't agree with what they're doing. But I don't have that severe negative push and where I want to get really angry and I want to go and beat them up or, you know, because that doesn't serve me. And so now... I can have a different behavior outside of myself. Just to run through this again, we have some event that happens outside of ourselves, something, you know, whether it be in this example, you know, winning the lottery or first kiss or the recession, whatever it is. And we take in the information through our five senses. We're going to delete, generalize and distort it based on our own internal filters. 
and only take in about 134 bits of information out of that 11 million bits of information per second that's that's possible so then of course we have this external behavior so any event that we experience as i said is a subjective experience and it has to do with the types of results that we get you see because our clients going to come to us for some reason whether it's enhancing in their business or their personal life whether they want to stop smoking they want to lose weight whatever it is that they want to achieve and a lot of our clients actually getting results will have a lot riding on the fact of how we think about our client and what we project out on our client as well and in fact they actually proved this so they took this group of kids these and this is a number of years ago and they took these kids to a teacher and they said listen teacher we uh, you know we don't have a, a teacher that can actually deal with these children because you know what these children are not the sharpest tool in the shed just kind of do the best that you can and that semester those kids all got C's and D's and so the next semester they took the exact same children and they took them to another teacher and they said listen these kids are so smart but we don't have a teacher that can actually keep up with them so just do the best that you can and that semester now bearing in mind these are the exact same children that semester those exact same kids got A's and B's you see the the way of thinking that that teacher was projecting out onto the children made a big difference in their performance so not only is perception projection relating to our performance but also to others you know, how we work with others you see your unconscious mind will perform and will work to that extent that you believe that it will and to the extent that you don't believe it will well it won't so if you believe that you can double your income or you believe that you can get the job that you want or you believe you can make the success that you want to do you're able to achieve that in fact I was telling this story to one of the classes actually one of the hypnotherapy classes and this particular lady gave a little bit of a smile and I, and I said to her you know what is it that you're thinking and she told us the story about her child and what had happened was her and her husband they already had two boys and she was now pregnant with a third boy and when she went in for one of the regular checkups and for the scans the nurse suddenly went a bit quiet and she called in the doctor and the doctor said look you know we need to send you for a uh, for, for, for some x-rays they took it to another room they took some x-rays and the doctor what they found was that this child had this essentially this hole in his head where his cerebellum should be and the doctor said to her look you know unfortunately this baby is not going to be able to walk and talk and breathe by himself and and really it's better just to have the abortion and she refused in fact the story got so much uh, out of hand her husband left her tried to declare her insane her family kind of pushed her away but she refused to have the abortion she carried that child through to term and after the baby was born she went and she lived on a farm and by the time she told us this story her boy was it was either seven or nine years old that's right he was seven years old because he was getting bored at nursery school and he was you know he was actually riding his bicycle without training wheels and he was speaking both english and afrikaans fluently he was jumping on the trampoline and doing somersaults now this is a boy that shouldn't be able to walk and talk and all those things but you see nobody told him that he doesn't have a cerebellum nobody told him that he can't do certain things and his mother absolutely believed that he would live a normal happy life now there's actually loads of stories like these on the internet as well there's in fact there's there's many other stories you've heard of people that have had a stroke and you know some people unfortunately they have a stroke and you know it affects their life negatively 
for the rest of their life. Where other people can have a stroke and the brain rewires and they return to normal. So perceptions projection is a really important concept for us to bear in mind. You know, what you see outside of you is just a reflection of what's going on inside of yourself. And the way that you react outside of yourself. You've got to ask yourself, what is it with inside of me that I need to deal with so that I don't have that negative reaction? As much as it's a neutral reaction, that's okay. But as much as it's a negative reaction, that means it's something that I need to deal with. So I love this. Your perception of me is a reflection of you and my reaction to you is an awareness of me. So that's perceptions projection and we'll come back to the NLP communication model again at a later stage. Okay, so next let's talk about focusing on what you want. If we still look at that NLP communication model on page 53, we said that we have this external event and we get bombarded by these 11 million bits of information per second of which we take in around about 134 bits of information after we delete, generalize and distort based on our internal filters of time, space, matter, energy, our values, beliefs, attitudes, meta programs, etc. And so once we've taken in that 134, what happens? We actually create this internal representation. Now on the left hand side of your page 53, this internal representation is made up of one of only six things or a combination of the six things that you can do inside of your head. So what do we do? Well, you create pictures, you create sounds, you create feelings, tastes, smells, and AD, which is self-talk. So those are the six things that, that you can do inside of your head. And so that is the internal representation. That internal representation is coupled with our state and coupled with your physiology to determine your external behavior. So how do you react or how do you behave based on that subjective experience that you've just had based on the external event. So as we look at this internal representation, state and physiology, if I can change any of those things, I can actually change my external behavior. Now that internal representation is really important because when you create the pictures, smells, sounds, feelings, tastes, self-talk, and that inside of your head, these things determine how you're going to act. So what that means is that your focus determines your behavior and ultimately your results. So what is it that I'm focusing on? Am I focusing on what I want or am I focusing on what I don't want? And so as Henry Ford said, whether you think you can or you think you can't, well, actually, either way you write. Michael Caine said, I have a policy. I never listen to anyone explain why they can't do something. I don't want to become convinced by them. What about Patanjali? In the Yoga Sutras, he mentioned, he said, Where there is negative thinking, let there be reflection on the contrary. So wherever there is negative thinking, let's really focus and look for the opposite. Let's look for the positive. And Tad James said, anxiety is simply a warning from your unconscious mind to focus on what you want. Isn't that amazing? You see, we have this, this wonderful computer on our shoulders and this wonderful ability to create. However, most often people create negative things. They create anxiety. They create fear of something in the future. And they, 
very often want to move away from things. Example, moving away from poverty rather than focusing on moving towards what we actually want, hypothetically wealth. And so, you know, let's just say that on the left hand side here, I have a 40 watt bulb. The bulb just in its own, if I put that in a room, it's not going to be as bright. Yeah? The light shines all around, it bounces off everything, it's, it's trying to illuminate the whole room. Whereas if I take that exact same 40 watts and I focus it, so a laser, that laser can actually cut through things. You know, they use lasers to cut through steel. So what's the difference? It is simply the focus. Focusing our attention and intention on getting what it is that we want. Not looking at what we don't want but rather what we do want. And so this focus then is extremely important. The next thing I want to talk about is neurotransmitters and how they bathe every cell in the body. Now Deepak Chopra wrote a book called Quantum Healing and in that book he spoke about these neurotransmitters and he, he said that this is actually our mind-body connection. And he said that these neurotransmitters bathe every cell in the human body. If we look here on the left hand side we have a neuron. And what happens? Information is sent electrically through the neurons. But once it hits the synaptic gap, the signal then gets converted as a chemical signal via those, those neurotransmitters, the little blue dots there are the neurotransmitters. And that transfers the signal and moves the signal and it then gets picked up again by the next neuron and converted again into electrical signal. So actually throughout your body you've got this electrochemical signaling. And these neurotransmitters bathe every cell in the body. You see when they first discovered neurotransmitters they thought they were only in the brain. And actually we have them right throughout the body. And what happens is these neurotransmitters actually pass signals from neuron to neuron. And this information, the signal that's being passed, can be passed right throughout the entire body. In fact, have and it happens instantaneously. Have you ever seen a snake or a spider or some scary experience? You know, you got this fear response. And you instantaneously had adrenaline rush throughout your body. You know, the heart starts to pump. Maybe your, uh, your breathing starts to, to uh, f speed up. And that signal passes through your body like 200 miles an hour. Now the neurotransmitters were involved in that. So you just had a thought. You thought you saw a snake. And your body responded accordingly. So what does that mean? As Deepak Chopra said, he said that our immune system is constantly eavesdropping on our thoughts. This internal dialogue that we have with ourselves, these, this internal representation that we have. If our focus is, oh no, you know, it's flu season and I'm, it's time now to get a flu or to get a cold. The body is going to respond. You see, because the body is eavesdropping on our thoughts. It's eavesdropping on our internal dialogue. So they say that we have 90,000 thoughts per day. You know, you've got to ask yourself, if we've got 90,000 thoughts a day, now they reckon that around 80 or 85% of those are the same thoughts that we have every day. And for most people, most of those thoughts are negative thoughts. So what is the sum total of all of that negative thinking that you've done up until this point. What is the sum total? What's the impact that that negative thinking has had on your performance, on your body, on your ability to achieve the things that you want to achieve? You know, the human nervous system has 10 to the 10th to the 11th neurological connections. That's a 10 with 110 zeros behind it. More than all the stars in the universe. 
And that's why you've got some people, as an example, that have a stroke and they can totally recover. Because the body and the mind can actually rewire itself. So just like Indy, the little boy, nobody told him he doesn't have the brains, he can't do this thing, he can't do that. He lived a normal, happy life. Think of talking to children. If you say to a child, you're stupid, you're stupid, you're stupid, eventually the child starts to believe they're stupid. And they start to actualize that behavior. So what is it? What is it that we really want to do? Just like that laser, we want to focus our attention and our intention to achieve what it is that we want to achieve. We want to move towards what it is that we want, not away from what we don't want. So as these neurotransmitters bathe every cell in the body and able to signal information throughout the entire body, it really helps then to be taking our focus on what it is that we want so that we can get our whole body and our whole mind working towards what we want. So the next theme I want to talk about is responsibility for change. If I said to you, close your eyes and relax the muscles around your eyes so they were so relaxed that you can't relax them anymore. And holding on to that relaxation, test them and make sure that they just won't work, that you can't open them. Then whose responsibility would it be to actually close the eyes and to relax those muscles that were so relaxed they just wouldn't work anymore? Of course, it would be the client's responsibility. And this is really important. You see, one of the worst clients that you can have is a client who says, okay, do this to me. Make me lose weight. Make me stop work uh, smoking. You know, I just want to forget about smoking. I, I don't want to do any exercises to lose weight, but just make me lose weight. I'd like you to consider this. Whether you're doing coaching or NLP or hypnotherapy or mindfulness or whatever you're doing, we don't do things to the client. The responsibility is always in the client's hand. Because NLP and coaching, it's not a do-to process, it's a do-with process. And it's transformational. We have, just like your transformer on your laptop, you have power that comes in from the wall socket. And that's the client's current state. And then... We do the induction and we're working with, whether that be NLP or whatever modality. And we then create with the client the new desired state. So just like the power that comes out of your, out of your wall socket through the transformer and goes into your laptop at 12 volts. That transformer, that induction, that's where we are working with the client. But it's the client's responsibility to do that. We can't do that to the client. NLP and coaching is, is not wielding any power over anybody. And so you can just take all of that weight off of your shoulder. Knowing that, of course, you do your best to work with your client. It's their responsibility to create change. Okay, let's talk about the four steps to learning next. And let's use the analogy of learning how to drive a car. You look across at mom and dad and, you know, they make this driving thing look really easy. And so you think, hey, you know what, I'll be able to do this. But before you get in the car and before you get in the driver's seat, you don't realize that you don't know how to drive. You see, at that stage, we are still unconsciously incompetent. And then, of course, you get in behind the wheel and you start the car and maybe jerk the car a few times and you stall it and all sorts of things happen. And then you realize, hey, you know what? Maybe I don't know how to drive yet. And so you become consciously incompetent. You become conscious of the fact that you don't know how to do it. However, of course, then as you practice... You get some driving skills, you get some driving practice, 
learning lessons in, in learning how to drive. And then you become consciously competent. So this is now where you are learning. You know what you need to do. You know if, I, if I'm pulling away, depending on what car you're driving, I need to release the clutch and add more petrol. If I'm going to turn, I need to look at my rear view mirror, look at my wing mirrors. I've got to put on my indicator, maybe check the blind spot. I might have to slow down, so release a little bit of pressure off the petrol. And so you, you know the things that you need to do. You sort of run them through your mind step by step by step as you become consciously competent. And then at some stage, you just start driving and you now become unconsciously competent. You know exactly what to do. In fact, you drive without even thinking about it. The driving becomes unconscious. And this is true for everything that we learn. And so the aim of this training is to help you to get to conscious competence. Help you know that, hey, if this is something that I might be facing, here's a set of techniques or here's a tool that I can use to create that change. And then the better you get, the more you practice, at some stage you become unconsciously competent. Let's talk about excellence next. And so one of the things I highly recommend to my clients is to focus on excellence. Now, it's really important as we talk about excellence, we talk about excellence and not perfection. Because to be fair, there's no such thing as perfection. Perfection will only drive you crazy. If the Wright brothers were waiting for the perfect airplane, we'd probably still be grounded. Edison didn't have the perfect light bulb the first time. As we go through life, anything that we do, we want to strive for excellence, not perfection and get caught in the trap of perfection, because then you never get started. But what is excellence? Why is it that so much today is, it's okay just to pass? In fact, imagine that you had a family member or somebody that needed to go see a brain surgeon. Would you like them to see the brain surgeon, which has kind of just passed? Or would you like them to see the brain surgeon, which has gotten for 100%? Get the brain surgeon, which is striving for excellence. In fact, I had one person in one of the courses, and this lady, oh, she asked, what's the pass rate for the test? Now, typically, I don't share that in the beginning of the training. And after I'd got all the tests back and I'd marked them and she said, well, what was the pass rate? And I said to her, oh, you know, what the pass rate was. And she said, well, if I knew that, I wouldn't have answered the other questions. Well, let me ask you, what kind of thought is that? Assuming that I only answer the certain amount of questions to get the pass, what happens if some of those questions were wrong or the answers were wrong? Then, of course, there would be no pass. So just going to pass, just going to be okay at stuff, I think, you know, lets us down. But I would suggest anything that we do in our life, let's strive for excellence. Let's go for gold. Let's go for 100%. And as we do that, we focus on this idea of empowerment, on cause versus effect. Am I at cause for everything that's going on in my life? Or am I at the effect side of life? And we said that being at cause is so much more empowering. Being able to take in the learnings so that we can create the change that we need to to get the outcomes that we want. As Aristotle said, we are what we repeatedly do. So excellence then is not an act, but a habit. <laughs>